So when do you think we're gonna find alien life? When we find it. That's Dr. Jill Tarter, the woman who literally pioneered the modern search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. If you've seen the movie Contact or read the book by Carl Sagan, you already know who Jill is. She's actually the inspiration behind Ellie Arroway. Now you're probably wondering, were Jill and Carl friends? And the answer is yes. She goes into that friendship in more detail in this interview that you're about to see. But some quick background information. Back in the 1970s, Jill co-founded the SETI Institute, which today remains the only organization dedicated dedicated to finding alien life, whether microbial or intelligent. She's a renowned astronomer who not only looked for aliens, but fundamentally reshaped how humanity is addressing one of its biggest questions. Are we alone? So I'd love to just start with how you got into SETI. Is it something that you kind of were always interested in or did it just kind of fall into your lap? No, it was a happy accident. Really? Really lucky accident. Okay. Um, I learned early in uh, my college career to program an early computer called a PDP-8S. Okay. I always thought the S stood for stupid <laughs> because there were, you had to set all the bits. There was no language. You had to set wow. the octal zeros and ones for every instruction. And there were 11 things this machine could do. But if you put them together in the right order, and you didn't screw up the ones and zeros, it could do wonderful stuff. And I knew how to program this. When I was in graduate school, uh, Stu Boyer, who was an X-ray astronomer, early study enthusiast at Berkeley, uh, was given a PDP-8 as a, a old, retired computer. Actually, the person who gave it to him was my later husband. Jack Welch. No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I knew how to program this computer. Stu wanted to use UC Berkeley's radio telescope at Hat Creek to do some SETI. And somebody told him, go talk to Jill. She knows how to do this. <laughs> so he came to my office and it was great. I mean, this is the first time we'd ever had a desktop computer. You know, it took two of us to get it on the desk, but <laughs> it was ours and it was fabulous. So Stu inspired me. I worked with him and it was just ever thereafter. Wow. I followed that course. And you went to undergraduate at Cornell, right? Yes. Where Carl Sagan taught for decades. You didn't study under him or anything, I right? I didn't. Carl was on sabbatical uh, oh. for a lot of the time I was there. And I was in the engineering school. So there was only one year that I would be have been taking astronomy and physics in the art school. Mm -hmm. And Carl wasn't there that year. Oh, but wow. But I knew about him. <laughs> knew about him for sure. And then you got to meet him later in life. It was great. That was yeah. a huge honor. And he's, yeah. um, you know, it was, yes, a huge honor to meet him. He's such an inspiration. And he was also a um, very special person to me because he was the only person person, only colleague I ever talked to as I was going through chemotherapy for breast cancer. Oh, wow. And Carl was going through even much more aggressive chemotherapy. Wow. Wishes and hopes and realities mm -hmm. clashing mm -hmm. in the slash burn and poison treatments that we had back then, yeah. still do today. Um, it was nice to have someone to talk to about that. Yeah. And in the context of a career and all the things you wanna do and all of the wonders there are yet to be discovered. To be able to bond over something very human while also both of you being very instrumental in searching for life beyond Earth is a really incredible experience. It was, it was very important for me. Absolutely. Really, I mean, to uh, talk to Carl, for example, about, he's a scientist, right? He, has a vision of how the universe works, but his father had died a few years beforehand. Mm -hmm. And he would have given almost anything to have one more conversation with his father mm -hmm. and trying to square that desire with his rational view of the universe uh, was very, mm -hmm. you know, it was um, warming wow. to talk to him about it. That reminds me of, you know, the iconic scene at the beginning of Contact where she's like, can I talk to my mom? 
And her dad is like, I don't know, sweetie. She's very far away. And I know that your father passed away very young too, right? And he, he was did. very instrumental in your life. And is that perception um, or that portrayal and contact, is that based on your relationship with your father? Well, and Carl's. I mean, Carl's. Yes. Yeah. And I think that uh, particularly for young women, uh, it's often our fathers who are, you know, the our mothers get us to get it done right mm -hmm. and we bless them for giving us those skills but our dads are often our inspirations mm -hmm. and you know when when somebody dies young mother or father or other relative they die young you learn a lesson in a very sad yeah. way but you learn to seize the day mm -hmm. to not to put off tomorrow till tomorrow what you can do today so carpe diem gets learned early can you tell me about how SETI came to be 40 years ago? <laughs> well, yes. Um, John Billingham, Dr. John Billingham at NASA Ames Research Center, John was really interested in this question of life beyond Earth. I, I'm not sure whatever gave him the, the larger viewpoint. And I think when he got so tired of the bureaucracy and hoops of, <laughs> of jumping through NASA and the federal government. He'd, he'd sit back and contemplate these, these larger thoughts. We had a tiny bit of federal funding okay. back then that John managed to, to create and no civil servant slots. So the question is, how do you stretch a fixed amount of funding year to year as your people get more expensive. We were getting all our people from local universities, right, right on uh, grants whose indirect costs reflected the university's need to maintain a sailboat for their donors and things like that. So they had overhead indirect rates in the order of 100%. So John got together with his good buddy, Barney Oliver, who ran HP Labs at the time. Okay. And Barney was really influential. Barney's the one who brought the first handheld calculator wow. to the public. Okay. Right? <laughs> Very smart guy whose mother happened to be an English teacher, which later led to Barney and I knocking heads about my grammar. <laughs> <laughs> but John and Barney hired Tom Pearson from San Francisco State University, who was in the uh, in administration there. And they hired him to do a business study. Okay, you got a fixed amount of money. How do you maximize it? Mm -hmm. And Tom looked around and said, you know, we're sitting here at NASA Ames. Mm -hmm. We're using their computers, but we're paying an indirect cost that reflects the university's need to support all kinds of other activities. So Tom came up with this plan that if we formed a nonprofit, mm -hmm. we could save NASA money because we could set an indirect cost rate that actually reflected what it cost us to do business. Great. Okay. So we had an indirect cost rate back then of 20% mm -hmm. as opposed to 100%, and it maintained for decades. So we stretched our dollars as far as we could. Very good idea. And it's been, um, it's been copied a number of times. That's amazing. That's amazing. Did you ever think back then that we'd be where we are today? Oh, goodness. No, I was just trying <laughs> day, day to day, year to year yeah. to keep things going. Mm. Uh, the expansive thought of having an institute didn't come until we had a charter that went to Sacramento and we got mm -hmm. um, made official. And that charter was broad. So it wasn't just looking for radio signals from potentially intelligent technology out there. It was looking for evidence of any kind uh, for life beyond Earth. So yeah, it was a really good idea and lots of, I, I hadn't expected it to be a good <laughs> idea for so many people, mm -hmm. but there were lots of these soft money people um, around who didn't particularly want to teach, so they didn't interact with the student base at their universities, 
but they wanted to be able to do their research. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, own limited dollars, want to stretch them as far as they can. So we were a good model and they came to us and we've thrived. One of the things that I really love about SETI is that it's not just science, it's also outreach and education. And I know you yourself have helped develop a, a couple curriculums here and there. Right. What can you say about you know, SETI's influence on science education and maybe where it's going in the future? Well, one thing that we decided to do was to see before our students, at least in California, get stoved piped into these independent disciplines, so, so the system tells us, of physics, biology, and chemistry. They take them as separate courses and they don't, you know, they don't really think they're related. So we did some work to develop a curriculum before that stove piping started mm. to help students understand how interrelated <laughs> things are, um, how biology is just a lot of chemistry and physics. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, pretty confidently that elsewhere, chemistry and physics are going to be the same. So maybe biology happens elsewhere. Right. And it was it was a great opportunity for us to give them something they could feel tangibly uh, engaged with. And so when we developed a curriculum that was all about life and them developing in the universe, it really was widely accepted. I felt fantastic about it. I love that SETI is incredibly multidisciplinary and science, outreach, education, art. <laughs> like, that's so cool. Thank you for setting that up and thank you for bringing this to the world. Oh, well, yeah, it's been really rewarding for me to see how this grew because, <laughs> you know, 40 years ago, who would have thunk it, yeah. right? And now, you know, the statement that we made back then, biology is just a bunch of chemistry and physics and chemistry and physics are going to be ubiquitous and therefore maybe biology. Today, we look at chemistry well, we have the ability to look at molecular interactions at the in a quantum mechanical way. It's making me wonder, <laughs> how can we say that with such confidence? What can we do to know that these proton and electron uh, coupled interactions in molecules are really the same out there? Because the tool we have for distance is spectroscopy, which is so broad in terms of the precision needed in frequency and time resolution um, that we can't see these quantum mechanical effects. But maybe biology really needs one of these intermediate steps. And it matters where an electron or a proton is on a molecule in the process of going from one state to another. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we prove it. <laughs> it's really bugging me and I'm really, I, so I'm hoping somebody yeah. in your audience says, oh, so-and-so is studying that. And this is how we can, in mm -hmm. fact, at a distance, try and understand what's going on at the molecular um, level. Because look at a distance, and you're averaging over your line of sight, over that path, you're averaging over lots and lots of atoms and molecules. And so how can you know about whether <laughs> biology only happens at one particular intermediary state, right? right. right? Um, hopefully it does. Yeah. And we'll figure out some way uh, to back up our claims that chemistry and biology will be, and physics will be ubiquitous. Yeah. So when do you think we're going to find alien life? When we find it. <laughs> when we find it. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, we're doing a fantastic job of doing more searching for things that we can define mm -hmm. as potentially engineered and not astrophysics. But I have to admit, we might be doing an extraordinarily great job at looking for exactly the wrong thing. And the detection of evidence of life, technology, and intelligence out there might come as the byproduct of some other exploration not intended for that goal at all. 
What are you most excited for over the next 20 or 40 years of SETI as we're celebrating the 40th anniversary? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be really interested how we deal with machines, Ooh, right? I because, like that. Because uh, we've made such strides in our ability to process data coming in from telescopes and other sources and working in real time so that maybe if we detect something, we can go back right away, right. see if it's still there. Great, great progress. But what might our machines be able to do? I mean, we've gone in my working career from um, operations per second to billions of floating point operations per second. You know, huge increase in speed. Absolutely. But we're only evolving those detection capabilities at the rate of human evolution and human learning mm -hmm. and cap machines. They're going to teach themselves to be a lot smarter than we are mm -hmm. much quicker. And so what are they going to, to find looking at data, even data we've had for a long time? in ways that we haven't been able to do before. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm excited yeah. about that. And I hope we come to a really good working relationship with machines. Mm -hmm. I mean, at base, we've taught them how to begin. Mm -hmm. They're going to get to a point where they can start teaching themselves faster than we can change. Mm -hmm. And let's hope that turns out to be a good working relationship. Let's build that future. Yeah, right? I'm Absolutely. all for that. Well, one more question for everyone watching. What advice would you give to the next generation of scientists and engineers and dreamers out there? Oh, yeah, my advice is think about your own questions. What fascinates you? What do you want to know the answers to mm -hmm. that we don't have answers for today? And then don't just think about it. Go figure out ways to answer your questions. I love that. That's, I love that. That so makes much. a good life. It absolutely does. Well, thank you so much, Jill. I really appreciate your time. And let's go celebrate the 40th anniversary of Sunny. Yahoo! <laughs>